So here we are in Hebrews 13. If you can have it open in front of you, that would be great. And I think as I've been preparing this, there are probably two dangers for me in preaching a text like this, which says things like, remember your leaders and have confidence in your leaders and submit to your leaders. While I myself am one of those leaders. Okay, so I'm preaching that to you now. And there's, I think, two dangers. There's the danger of me misusing the authority of God's word to tell you that you've just all got to do what I say. Okay, that's a danger, isn't it? Look, God says it. Submit to your leaders. I'm one of your leaders, so you should just kind of do what I say. Without any acknowledgement that actually, I don't have the final say. Scripture does. God does. Right? That's what I ought to be acknowledging, shouldn't it? And not abusing uh, what this text says for kind of my own ends, if you like. It is, of course, wrong to create this kind of unbiblical pressure on a church to submit to its leaders regardless of how Christ-like they are, regardless of how scripturally shaped they and their teaching are. That's always wrong. Now, um, I'm not immune to that danger. I'm not immune for the desire to have an ego trip. But I think that the other danger is probably more likely for me, though I'll ask you to pray for the Lord to guard me against that first danger too, that egotistical kind of desire. But the second danger is this, I think, that I would worry tonight so much about appearing to want an ego trip that I soft pedal what the text actually says, that I kind of draw back from actually trying to preach and teach the, the force of what the scripture says here in terms of what is required of you, in terms of your attitude towards leaders of a church like this. So it's a, it's a kind of a fine line to walk, isn't it, for me preaching as a leader, saying this is how you should relate to leaders. But for me to kind of draw back from it because I worry of how it might appear, that wouldn't do you any good either. You cannot benefit from this part of God's word or indeed any part of God's word talking about how we relate to those in authority over us. We can't benefit from it if you or I get embarrassed or uncomfortable about the biblical idea of godly submission to godly authority. Those, those are things. Of course, of course there are clear and lamentable abuses of authority in the world today. That is just blindingly obvious, isn't it? And tragically, there are abuses of authority in the church as well, in local churches. And that happens, and there are horror stories, and there are uh, just sad tales of where church leaders, just as secular leaders in, in government or whatever might abuse their authority wrongly and it's painful to uh, hear about those things more painful even to go through them and, and experience them and maybe you have in a church that you've been part of um, at some point in your life but at the same time as there being obvious abuses of, of authority there is also scripturally such a thing as godly sacrificial authority as well we know that because at the very least, it's what Jesus had. Jesus had authority, didn't he? But what did he say? I have authority to lay down my life. And I have authority to take it up again. In other words, his authority was employed in the service of others. His authority was that by which he chose to lay down his life that others might benefit. That their sins might be taken away. And he had authority to, to do that. So... There is um, authority which is good, authority which is humble and sacrificial and others-centred rather than self-centred. And that is good leadership to which uh, everyone both can and should submit. Okay, there are kinds of authority to which you should not submit, but this kind of authority, Jesus' kind of authority, is the kind which Christians are called to submit to. In fact, the very act of becoming a Christian is an act of saying, Jesus, you are in charge and I am not, and I let you lead me. Okay, That is godly submission to godly authority. 
And therefore, in as much as and as far as a leader is like Jesus, respect in a similar way for that Christ-like leadership is what God calls every church member to. And there is a good reason for that, and the reason is because God wants your good, because he has set these structures of authority in certain places in our society, in government, to citizens, in the home, particularly parents to children, and to a degree husbands to wives, but also in the church, um, where certain people are placed in positions of authority over Others there, I just don't think you can avoid that in scripture, though that is unpalatable to much of our society today, the idea of authority being possibly a good thing, yet that is clearly what scripture says, and it benefits us. Every local church leader, and Andrew and I definitely we included in this, we want the good of the church too. We are not in it just for our own gain, or because we like a power trip, but because we want to serve. And of course, we are flawed and make mistakes, sometimes significant mistakes, and sin as well, and fail. And we are ever so conscious of our shortcomings. And yet, at the same time, I think we can honestly say we, we seek the good of the church and want then that good balance of good leadership and good membership, if you like, to work together. And the way that you behave towards your leaders is actually for your good, and not simply theirs. It's a really um, interesting way that the author puts it, particularly in verse 17. Would you look with me at verse 17 of Hebrews 30, where he says, Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority, because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. It's really interesting what he says. You would almost expect him to say, do this so that their, their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to them, to the leaders. But he doesn't say that. He says, if the leaders find it a burden to lead you, that won't benefit you, the led. It's not about giving the leaders a comfy life. Ultimately, it's about saying, it's no, it's no good for you if your leaders are burdened and struggling and Serving you is, is just a, joy, a, a joyless and difficult uh, endeavour day by day. So it's actually for your own good that the author calls you to uh, relate well to those in authority over you. So I'm saying, though it's hard for me to, to say, here we are, working through Hebrews, here it is, I'm going to preach this because it's next. Uh, but it's important that we consider it. I'm saying don't chafe against this teaching. It don't don't kind of rebel against the idea of godly authority. Don't assume I'm rubbing my hands at this opportunity to impose my will upon you. That's, that's not how it works. Don't marinate in the spirit of this world, which treats all authorities kind of suspicious, or at least you get that impression sometimes. Because that is, of course, a trend begun by a serpent. You say, did this authority figure really say that? Has he really got your good in mind? That's what the serpent said, wasn't it, in Eden? And we see how that went on. Christ-like authority, on the other hand, demands your respect and love and thanks. Am I, or Andrew, are we always perfectly Christ-like? No. And yet neither were the leaders in the church of the Hebrews. And still the author calls them to relate to them in this way. So how are we to do this well? How can you benefit yourself and your leaders most in these relationships? I've got four things, I'm fairly brief hopefully to say, that come out of this passage. And this is the first one. Follow their example. You want to relate well to your leaders? Number one, follow their example. Verse seven, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Now when he says remember your leaders, he seems to be saying, not remember simply the leaders who are currently your leaders, but I think he's thinking about people particularly from the past, because he says, those who spoke, past tense, who spoke the word of God to you. So he's thinking particularly of people who had an influence in the Hebrews coming to faith in the first place, I think. That's what he's thinking of. People who were influential in their conversion. Remember them. Be thankful for them. We've sung a couple of songs which have that kind of tone. Thank you, Lord, for people who've gone before us, 
who taught us the word of God, who spoke to us about Jesus. And for most of you here today, some of you are exceptions to this, but most of you, I don't think this is actually going to refer to me or to Andrew, those who were influential most in your conversion, for some of you, it will be, me or Andrew. Um, but for others of you, you can remember back. Can you think of a person who spoke to you about the Lord Jesus Christ? Perhaps it was a, a parent, perhaps it was a friend, a neighbour, uh, maybe it was someone on the street who first met you and said, oh, I'd like to give you this and talk to you about Jesus. But all of you have had someone in the past, haven't you, who spoke the word of God to you and who commended the Lord Jesus to you. And in the end, you were converted. And you should say, thank you, Lord. I remember those people with gratitude. Or maybe it's not the person who necessarily led you to faith, but someone who had a real influence in your life and taught you what it meant to be a mature Christian or helped you over a particular challenge in your Christian life or taught you how to pray or something like that. I was, uh, as many of you know, in London yesterday at the Grace Baptist Mission annual meetings and um, you meet a load of people there, you, most of them you just say hi to and some old friends and some new faces. And um, I, I was just having a, a tea with, with Joe and with some of his friends and I hadn't uh, met all of his friends um, before but there was a young woman there who was um, doing a, a degree I think in physiotherapy I've not met her before but she said oh, I'm just going to start a placement in Ormskirk you know what Ormskirk is it's kind of Liverpool way isn't it and as soon as she said oh, I'm going to start a placement in Ormskirk I went oh that's so, that's so good to hear there's a great church in Ormskirk because you know the pastor of the church in Ormskirk was the man who spoke the word of God to me 27 years ago when I became a Christian and that man uh, is now a pastor of that church in Oxford. He's been there a long time. But he came to a meeting at our church, gave his testimony, and God works in my life. My eyes were open. I saw I was a sinner. I needed to repent and believe, and I did, and I've been a Christian ever since. And I say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for Billy, that pastor who came to, to preach. And now this girl is going to the place where he is a pastor there. So can you remember somebody like that? The question the author is asking you is, what were they like? What was that person like? Think of a person who's influenced you for good, either for your conversion or for your growth in grace. What was that person like? What's that person? Are you thinking of them now? What was that person like? Were they arrogant or rude? Were they difficult? Were they ungracious or impatient with you? They said, come on, hurry up and become a Christian. What's, what's the problem? Did they, did they treat you like that? Did they treat you disrespectfully? Well, I doubt it, because those people who've had that influence in our lives, we remember them, don't we, for their, their graciousness and their kindness, their patience with us, their love for the Lord Jesus, their love for us. And that's why the author introduces them here. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. So he's saying, you remember what they were like? You be like that too. If they were gracious towards you and gave you time while you were still not a Christian, Give those other people in your life time. Be patient with them. Be gracious. Be kind. Be warm. Be helpful. Follow their example. You see? Saying, remember the outcome. What happened in your life through their attitude? Great things. Eternal life came your way because of them. Might it come other people's way because of you? As you imitate their faith, follow their example. And even if that's a long time ago and so much has changed, and maybe it's a distant memory what happened then, Remember this, he says, even if lots has changed in your life, there's something that hasn't, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. You could spend a whole message on that verse, couldn't you? What a wonderful <coughs> confession of Jesus. But he just inserts it here, it's a rather unusual sort of place to pop it in, isn't it? But I think that's what he's doing. Is he saying, like, even if much has changed since that time long ago that you're remembering, Jesus has him. So hold on to him. Be like him. Follow their example. That's a good way to relate to leaders, particularly those who've had a good influence over you in the past. Follow their example. Number two, consider their teaching. Consider their teaching. And there's kind of more to say here because the next few verses are taken up with this. So that succinct confession we've just seen in verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. That is immediately followed up 
by a warning against erroneous and dangerous teaching that in contrast will do you no good at all. So verse 9, do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. Unfortunately, our world today is still full of a variety of strange teachings. Roger was mentioning some in his prayer earlier. Unbiblical ideas that masquerade as things that are good and worth listening to. And especially today, um, it, where we've got the internet and just every kind of view that you might want under the sun, um, you can go and find or hear all kinds of things, many of which are not helpful or not true. Now, let me quickly say after that, there is a whole ton of stuff out there, and especially on the internet, which is really good as well and worth finding and learning from. But there's a whole load of stuff also uh, which will lead a Christian far astray from their Lord or from biblical Christianity. So how do you discern what's good and what's not good? Well, uh, you could have as a rule of thumb 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, test everything, hold on to what is good. Okay? How do you test everything? Test everything by what God says in Scripture. Now, of course, there's, a, there's various questions of doctrine and practice which different Christians come uh, up with different answers as to how to live and, and what to believe, and there's certainly room for that variety. And we don't go around condemning people who have slight variations on um, what we think the Scripture teaches, as long as they are seeking to be faithful to Scripture. But what this is referring to is not that. It's where people are going against the uh, obvious, plain meaning of Scripture, where they are teaching against, for example, the idea of salvation by faith alone, in Christ alone. They add other things and say, oh, Yes, you need Jesus, but you need this as well. Or if it, they start to deny things like the fact that Jesus died as uh, under the wrath of God for our sins, a penalty was being paid on the cross. Some people purporting to be Christians would say, oh, no, no, let's not talk about this, this punishment stuff and this wrath stuff. It's all too horrid. It's not appropriate for today. Well, that's a denial, isn't it, of what Scripture teaches and of what our sin is like and what Jesus needed to do as is clearly taught in Scripture. So those big things we're talking about, right, which uh, we, we can't be led astray on. Don't be carried away, says, by all kinds of strange teachings. Test everything. Hold on to what is good. And good leaders are there to help you with that, right? Good leaders are there to open the Word of God and not to kind of peddle their view and say, oh, you've got to believe the same as me. No, good leaders are there to open the Bible and say, do you see it for yourself? Right? Do you see it in the text? You see, this is what God is saying, and you might you know, disagree occasionally. You think, well, I'm not sure he's really saying that. Well, that's okay. We can talk about that. But hopefully, the big things of Scripture, they should be found there in a pastor's teaching, in an elder's teaching, that you, you can't deny or contradict because it's clear in Scripture. And a, a good leader is there to, to do that, to unfold the Word of God, for you to, to be able to say, oh, yeah, I, I see there it is, isn't that? Wonderful. There's Jesus. So my job is to help you be able to read the word yourself so you can stand secure on what God says. You're not standing secure on me or my teaching. You're not relying on what Luke says or Andrew says. You're relying on the word of God. You're certainly not relying on what the internet says. Okay, That's what the rest of people is asked Sometimes the internet will say, what's in God's word? In that case, great. Stand on that. But always coming back to the scriptures, because there is the living word, active and fresh and real and true for us. And the author then unfolds what I think is sort of five brief things that should always characterise a biblical preaching ministry that you should be on the lookout for. And if any one of these five things is lacking, you should start to get wary and ask questions of the person teaching you, or of the thing that you're watching online, or the thing you're hearing in some other ministry or church. The first thing um, that needs to be present is the idea of grace. Okay? Grace. Verse 9 continues, It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace. 
not by eating ceremonial food, which is of no benefit to those who do so. Okay, the author is emphasizing the Bible idea of God's unmerited kindness, God's goodness to sinners, God who justifies not the righteous, but the ungodly, people who come to him in all their wickedness and sin and disgrace and mess and horror and pollution, and God says, forgive him. God says, I love you for Christ's sake. I love you because of the cross. I forgive all your sins. I remove them all from you. You haven't done a thing to deserve it, but I do it anyway because I'm a God of grace. And amazingly enough, tremendous to that truth is, there is always the danger of losing sight of that in a church or in a ministry, of subtly adding something else, of saying, well, yes, grace, but we really need to try hard as well. No, you don't need to try hard to be saved. You need to trust Christ, that's all. Don't add, don't take away. I think Paul Linton was here a few weeks ago, some of you, very helped by his ministry. I, 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 um, you spoke to me about it, and I'm so glad to hear that he preached that, that message. Don't add, don't take away from the gospel of grace. And that's what the author is doing. He talks about uh, people who are clearly trying to get into the fellowship of the Hebrews and say, yeah, but you, you eat this special food as well. The, the, to, maybe it's the, the background of Judaism. People were saying, oh, yeah, you've got to go through these rituals as well and, and obey the food laws. No, 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 he says. Grace of <coughs> The overwhelming grace of God to just sheer utter awful sinners should be emphasised so much, I think, that sometimes you will begin to wonder whether I really believe that sin matters at all. That's a mark of gospel grace ministry, is that you start to think, hold on, does he, does he really think sin matters? Yes, sin matters, sin's horrendous and awful, but sin is a weakling compared to the grace of God. For that, we need to be clear that sin cannot overcome the grace of God. And we are not to be wallowing in our misery over our sin, forgetting that in Christ all is paid for and done with. Grace should reign so comprehensively that it makes sin seem an irrelevance in that sense. So the much so you go, mm, what's he teaching? But that's what happened to Paul when he spoke about grace. He said, what then? You're, a you're asking me, should we then sin so that Grace may abound? No, 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 you misunderstood. Oh, I'm glad you're asking the question, because it shows you understood how great grace is. Grace, then, that's the number one element to uh, a biblical teaching ministry you should consider. Second, cross, the cross. Verse 10, we have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. And when he says, we have an altar, he's obviously not thinking of a literal altar on which sacrifices were burned, but he's thinking of the true altar to which the Old Testament altars were pointing, the cross of Christ, where he was sacrificed for our sins. And he says, if you are um, still holding on to the old regulations and obeying this rule or that to be a true Christian, well then you have no right to eat at this new altar. At the cross, you have no right to come there. Rather, remember that all of the Old Testament was pointing forward to Jesus. Verse 11, the high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. Well, what's all that about? He says, well, what I've been trying to say in my whole letter, it was pointing to Jesus. Verse 12, and so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate the fulfilment of all that sacrificial imagery to make the people holy through his own blood. Okay, that's the heart of the gospel. Christ suffered for our sins to make us holy through his own blood. And folks, if therefore I or Andrew stop mentioning the cross, sack me. All right? Get rid of us or say we've got to have a vote with no confidence. All right? That is, I'm deadly serious. Paul says, God forbid that I boast in anything except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I resolve to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That is the absolute core. Jesus suffered. The righteous one, the holy one, the perfect one, suffered with our sin, imprinted on him, awash with sin, so that all our sin could be taken away. Christ suffered the punishment of, of hell for us. I was um, preaching in Gloucester the other week in, uh, with my uh, good friend Matt Gamston, who's a pastor there, and uh, I, I, one of the messages I preached was on the cross. I preached, oh my God, my God, why have you forsaken me from Matthew 27? 
And uh, I preached about the, just the horror of what happened to Christ because he was taking our sin. He became our sin for us. And, and uh, I think God was speaking through, through that. And, and Matt gave me a lift back to the station in his car afterwards and he said, oh, thank you for that. It's just so offensive, isn't it? He said, it's just so offensive. It's so true, it's so it's wonderful news, he said, but it is so offensive. And he was thanking me because it's sometimes easy to forget, actually, that the, the gospel says we, we're an offence. And when we preach the cross, we're reminded of what our sin is and what it did to the Holy One, Jesus. And we need to remember that. We can't sanitise the cross. We can't say, oh, we're Christians, everyone's kind of nice, it's all nice. It's not. It's about, it's about blood and it's about sledgehammers breaking people's legs. It's about wrath, it's about hell. It's about horror, because we deserve that, and he endured it for us. The cross has to stay there, at the centre of, of biblical teaching. So please make sure it does. Okay, Hold me to that, and Andrew to that. Grace, the cross, number three, sacrifice. So we're looking at the, the things we should be considering in, a, in an elder's teaching. Sacrifice. And when I say that, I don't mean the sacrifice now that Christ made, but the way we follow him in our lives should be a life of sacrifice. Verse 13, since Jesus went outside the camp, let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. So the cross of Christ is not just our way of salvation, it's actually also our pattern for life. He bore disgrace, and we trust him as our saviour, but we also follow him as our example, willing to bear the same disgrace. That means that a preaching ministry should emphasise that no one should ever be shocked or outraged or offended when people are unkind to us because we're Christians. You shouldn't kind of go, how dare you? I am a Christian. No, you should say, oh yeah, the Bible told me to expect that. You know, we're not blasé or naive and go kind of, don't mind. So it doesn't hurt when people are like that. But we're not shocked. We're not outraged. We're not bitter or offended, we say, like the apostles, thank you, Lord, I'd be considered worthy, worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. That's just par for the course, it's standard. And if I or Andrew or anyone else fails to emphasise that there's a, cro- a cost in following Christ, we're, we're going wrong. That ought to be a pillar of what we're saying. Yes, grace, yes, a cross. Third, sacrifice. Fourthly, hope. It's not all about suffering. It's not all about, oh dear, misery, we're Christians now, everyone's going to hate us. Well, maybe we'll have a hard time. But the writer says in verse 14, for here we do not have an enduring city. So don't get comfortable here. Don't think that life's supposed to be comfortable here. No, we are looking for the city that's to come. An emphasis of a biblical preaching ministry should always be, look forward. Something's coming. The next life, the new creation, the return of Christ. If that starts to get lost, smell a rat. Can't just focus on our kind of troubles now, but we're to look ahead, have that hope of the future to come. This is not your home. The United Kingdom is not your home. Okay, even if you were born here, even if you came here and have made it your home, it's not your home. The new creation is your home. This is not your main life that you're living. This is your first and small life, your little life, your prelude life compared to the life to come. Okay, we're not to. Think, oh, I'm going to you know, make everything about now. I'm going to put my roots down here. No, we, we're exiles and strangers. We're passing through. A teaching ministry worthy of the name of Christ will always be pointing you forward. So expect that to, to happen and pray that Andrew and I will always be doing that. That's the fourth element of teaching that you should consider and apply to your life. And the fifth one is witness. Witness. Verse 15. Through Jesus, therefore... Let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. In other words, a ministry that just encourages us all to just kind of sit tight and wait for the coming of Christ is not a ministry worthy of the name. It's not like, oh great, we're Christians now, let's just stay here and kind of hope that Jesus comes soon. Just forget about the world, it's dangerous out there, don't don't engage. No, that's not it. Let's continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. Let's be going out, let's be thankful and bold and courageous and where we can, speaking of his goodness and offering invitations to church and, and saying, can I help you? You're obviously going through a hard time, let me 
pray for you. Would you allow me to do that? And all kinds of ways in which we can profess the name of Christ and say, I'm a Christian, and for his sake, I want to do you good. Because it's not just about our words, as verse 16 says. Do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Not just about talking the talk, it's about walking the walk and being a genuine help and a comfort. Someone who is practical and thoughtful about others. And a biblical teaching ministry should always be encouraging that. And I hope that Andrew and I are saying, let's keep praying for our world. Let's pray for our town. Let's, let's evangelise. Let's work. Let's be reaching out. Let's not just be sitting in and thinking, oh, let's kind of have a bunker mentality and oh, I hope everything's going to be okay. Let's move out and watch God at work in the nations and in our town. Okay? So... Uh, that was the, the second big thing, and that, that was the, the main thing, which is going to be the, the longest. We said, how are we relating to our leaders? We say, number one, follow their example. Number two, consider their teaching. Is it all there? Grace, cross, sacrifice, hope, witness. Are those elements there? Then the third and the fourth thing, more briefly. Submit to their authority. Submit to their authority. Just read it to you. It's what it says. Verse 17, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority. But it's important you see the reason for this. It's not just do what they say. There's a reason given. This is the ultimate protection against the ungodly abuse of authority by leaders. Just as also it's the ultimate protection against ungodly resistance to scriptural authority. What is that uh, protection? Verse 17, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Right, so church leaders are to be very conscious in the way that they lead that there is a day coming when how they have led, how they have served, how they have sacrificed or not is going to be judged. And that's a sobering thought for, for me, a sobering thought for Andrew and anyone who's been in church leadership who might be. The fact is there's a day coming when, when leaders of churches will be held to account for the people who are entrusted to their care, and that will happen to them in a way that won't happen to those people who were under their care. There will be a different standard, if you like. There will be a different judgment. James says that explicitly. You, it's actually just over the page, so it happens to be the next book. If you want to look it up, James chapter 3. It says, not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who, ju- who teach will be judged more strictly. James 3 verse 1, right? So, <laughs> in no way am I saying, oh, that makes me better than you. Do you see how that makes it more sobering for me as a teacher? And that's why not many should become teachers. Because it's not like, hey, great, I get to tell people what to do. No, you get to stand on the day of judgment to answer for the people who are entrusted your care. Are you ready for that? I, I assure you I say that with no lightness at all. It should make leaders diligent, humble, earnest, prayerful, and it should cause every church member to make it their aim to have as much confidence in their leaders as, as they can possibly muster. I'm just reading the text back to you, right? Aim to make my work a joy, not a burden. That's what the text says. Because I must give an account. And if I, Andrew, uh, find the work of serving a local church like this just a misery and a burden, and it's awful, awful and horrible, then it's going to be difficult for us to go about our work in a way that will actually serve you well. And end up with me being able to say, us being able to say on the day of judgment, we discharged our duties faithfully and joyfully. Now, I assure you once again that as a leader of this church, I can say, you already do a great job of making my work a joy and not a burden. Okay, let's just make that clear. I love pastoring this church, I absolutely love it. And when I'm away, and I'm preaching in some other place, or I'm away on holiday or whatever. I, I want to be back. I, 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 there's something nice about meeting up with old friends or being in a different church sometimes, but I always think, I just want to be home. I just want to be in Grace Baptist Church, Halifax. 
That's where I belong. It's where my friends are, it's where my people are, it's where the people are whom God has entrusted to my care. And that's where I want to be. Because you do make it a joy. Honestly, I'm not just saying it because it's there. I'm, I'm saying it because I mean it. And I'm thankful to you for it. But if God makes my work and Andrew's work a joy, a burden through you, the devil won't like it. Right? And he will constantly want to disrupt that joy and cause church members to fall into patterns where they start to make it more of a burden than a joy. Now I repeat, I, 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 there are pastoral burdens for me now and have been for the last 13 years. And yet, my, I look back as a whole and say it's not been a burden, it's been a joy. But I, I know it, it can easily become uh, painful and difficult. I, again, I met an old friend yesterday at the annual meeting to Grace Baptist Mission. She's a member of a church in Hertfordshire, close to where I grew up. And uh, I used to help lead uh, a local kind of youth work between our churches um, with her. And it was really nice to see her. And she said, we're just appointing a new pastor. We're really thankful. He's come and this guy is, is going to become a pastor in January, I think. Well, I was so pleased to hear that. I said, fantastic. Because it's been quite a while, hasn't it, since you had a pastor. The guy who was there it was quite a few years since he was here. And she said, oh, no, actually, no. We've had someone else in between him and this guy. I said, oh, he didn't last that long then. She said, no, it was, it was, it was okay. He was doing all right. He hadn't done anything wrong. Didn't fall into immorality. But then she said, just things in the church just got ugly. That's how she put it. Just got ugly. And she, she, would, she, would, she wasn't going to elaborate on that and say, well, this person said this, or this person did that. But isn't that sad? When in a church like this, right, it'd be very, very similar to this. She said, just people, basically, just got ugly. And, and it just got divisive. And it got so difficult that this guy just had to step down. Because his work became a burden, not a joy. So I'm saying it can happen. I'm saying it's not happening at the moment here. But the devil knows that and wants to disrupt that. So let's watch out. Let's be wise and careful and as much as you can have confidence in your leaders submit to their authority not some unbiblical authority not some kind of top down heavy handed heavy shepherded kind of authority god forbid that andrew or i should ever do that and yet where it's godly christ-like authority do your best to say it we're gonna we're gonna follow that we're gonna support that we're gonna give our leaders joy in doing that why like we said at the start because if that doesn't happen it's no benefit to you he says not that it's about us, it's about you. It's about you benefiting from leaders who are able to go about their work with joy. So, submit to their authority. Follow their example, consider their teaching, submit to their authority, and finally, pray for their holiness. Pray for their holiness. Verse 18. Pray for us. I believe, I might be wrong about this, I'm pretty sure it was Charles Spurgeon, the Victorian preacher, uh, in London. Great preacher. Massive impact. He said, my people's greatest need is my own personal holiness. As a leader, he felt that the, the, the greatest need of his people was not that he preached his magnificent sermons, but that he, were, that he was a holy man. That he was a prayerful man. That he was a godly man who wouldn't fall morally. who wouldn't uh, stain the name of Christ through some bad act or words of his. My people's greatest need is my own personal holiness. So he used to urge his people to pray for him, to pray that he'd be supported by the Lord and sustain and not fall into sin and not do a discredit to the name of Christ where he was. Pray for us, he says. So I encourage you to pray for us. Pray for me and Andrew, as I know many of you already do. Because I think verse 18 continues in a way that possibly is for me, the most challenging verse in the whole passage, maybe the whole letter, maybe the whole New Testament for me. We are sure, we leaders are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honourably in every way. Can I really say that? I have a clear conscience. Oh, I'm so conscious of many mistakes and many faults and many failings. I pray that I'll be able to have a clear conscience. That I desire to live honourably in every way. That Andrew and I would, would be men like that. It doesn't matter if we're not famous. It doesn't matter if we're not kind of known or that we're regarded as, as kind of silver tongued preachers or something. We, we don't care about that. We care that we live honourably and we're a credit to the Lord Jesus Christ in this town and as a church. That we'd have a clear conscience. 
so that when we stand before the Lord, we'll be able to say, yeah, I, we did what we could to care for your people in a godly way. So pray for that. But what I can also say is that the last verse, 19, uh, is echoed in my own heart. Where he says, I particularly urge you to pray that I may be restored to you soon. Why? He, he wants to be with them. As I was saying earlier, you know, when I'm away, I want to be here. And that's the case because he loved fellowship with them. And in fact, I think that I can personally say, I know it's been quite personal tonight, and I hope you, you forgive that. It's just the nature of the message tonight. I, I hope that you can, you can see that. And something is going right if uh, our relationship is, is good between leaders and people. Let's pray then for God's help for it not only to stay that way, but also for our love to grow and our fellowship to grow in the Lord as we seek to do these things. Let's pray for that now. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the clarity and warmth of your word. And we pray you'd help us each help Andrew and I as leaders of the church to be men who have a clear conscience, who love your people, and who desire to live honourably in every way. Keep us from falling into sin. And Lord, for each uh, member of this church, we pray for your help for each one of them to uh, have confidence in their leaders, to submit to their authority, and for us all to have joy together as we work together for your glory in our community. Help us, we pray, forgive our sins and where we've got this wrong. Help us to, to honour you as we go forward as a church. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen.